Hey everybody, welcome back to Historical Light, an independent Masonic show focused on the historical events and aspects of Freemasonry. As always, I'm your host, Brother Alex Powers, uh, past master Gardner Lodge District Deputy for 9A and Director for Kansas Lodge of Research. We have with us, as always, our co-host, Brother Robert Marshall. If you don't mind, I'll kick it over to you and let you introduce yourself. Robert Marshall here, uh, still Secretary of Waco Lodge in Central Texas and uh, Deputy Director with Brother Powers of the Kansas Lodge of Research. And uh, as always, happy to be here with a, in my opinion, pretty special guest tonight. And a fancy new camera. That's right. Yeah, look at that quality. I like it. Thanks for joining us again, man. We appreciate you being here. And as he mentioned, we have a special guest this evening. Uh, some of you know him, some of you don't, but you're going to love the story that we have to share this evening. Uh, Brother Jeej Wiles. Uh, if you don't mind, brother, I'm going to kick it over to you, let you introduce yourself as well. Yeah, sounds good. Like Alex just said, my name's Jeej Wiles. This is Captain Ahab behind me. Uh, just Master Masons. My title in masonry is a very short one at the moment. Still exploring every option there is out there, but haven't really committed to the, the chairs or anything just yet. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being here this evening. I know everyone's kind of wondering what's up with the yellow dude in the background. Uh, if you know him, you know it's an awesome story. If you don't, you're going to get to know him and uh, you're going to want to know more about the story. It's really pretty cool. Um, but you know, you mentioned you're a Master Mason. What lodge are you a member of, brother? Um, so my home base for masonry right now is actually Ezekiel Bates. It's nice. not in my hometown or anything, but they are... Um, I, I don't know if it's debatable or not, but I think they're the most active lodge probably in Massachusetts, and I'm a very active person, so I just feel like their pace sort of matches mine at the moment, so I like to support them. Yeah, no, it's a very awesome lodge, and actually now we have a cool connection because I'm a member there as well, so that's, oh, that's there we go. Cool. Yeah. Not surprising yeah. at all. No. Well, I obviously we met at the uh, Masonic Con up there. Right, right. And uh, after uh, doing a couple of those, uh, Brian lightly twisted my arm and I, I couldn't say no. It's it, yeah. it's really an awesome lodge. They do so much for the area. I mean, and with the Masonic Con deal, they've really done so much for masonry as a whole on the right. national scene and farther. So, yeah. I was going to say, say no. that's expanding all over. There's more and more. For I sure. just saw the the Cooperstown link you shared Yeah. recently. Yeah. And now that, you know, there's just another con. I don't it's impossible to do them all i feel like at this point in a year but well before we go any further um because i don't want to forget that all uh, right brother robert you want to go ahead and uh, tell them what's a little bit special about the cooperstown deal oh sure uh so uh the cooperstown masonic con as far as i know is going to be a one-off event so a lot of guys they hear about masonic cons and they think well i'm not going to go this year but i'm going to go next year can't do that with this one it's in uh uh, it's happening concurrently with a special anniversary of Otsego Lodge, uh, which was talked about in the previous episode of Historical Light. And uh, at least a portion of the Masonic Con will be at the actual Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, uh, which is why I'm, uh, I've am i been asked to participate. Uh, an early member of my lodge was Ted Lyons, one of the greatest baseball pitchers of all time. Uh, I wrote a biography about him, and so I'm going to go out there and not only talk about him, but also share some of the rather unique memorabilia we have right here in the lodge uh, from Brother Lyons. Uh, I don't know if he and the secretary at the time were friends originally or what, but they maintained correspondence throughout Brother Lyons' entire career halfway across the country. And uh, Brother Lyons signed a lot of news articles from his big games and sent them back to the lodge and uh, with notes like, uh, show this one to the boys and stuff like that. So uh, should be a pretty cool time. Heck yeah. So if you guys are in the area or going to be in the area, you got an interest in, you know, these uh, Masonic cons that are going on or baseball in general, uh, definitely check that out. Historical Light with Robert will be there. So really proud to have uh, Robert going up there to represent us. And, and I know it's going to be a really cool speech. Uh, Robert's really good at, at doing those presentations. So you don't want to miss out on that. And then uh, Brother Jeech, I think we'll jump back to you. So we usually start these out with uh, just a couple of prompter questions. Uh, you know, we love to cover the history. So I kind of want to know, do you have any family history uh, within Freemasonry? Yeah, so my father, my uncle, um, my great uncle, and a few others on that side of the family were all into Masonry locally here at uh, Williams Lodge in Williamstown, Mass. Um, but that didn't really get me started into masonry i don't think i always saw my uncle and my old man you know getting dressed up leaving the house type of thing but they weren't 
you know, they didn't talk about it much. And we all know it. it's not because super secretive in, in some, you know, uh, way, but it's just, they just sort of did their thing every couple times a month type of thing. And I always noticed it, but we never really discussed it. And then I got into it because the mayor of North Adams, the first mayor of North Adams donated his house to the Masons and they built oh, wow. a lodge off the back. So hmm. it, it turned into this mansion. And I was always curious about the building and such. And I started talking to a few people that took care of the building and I started helping with the building. And then we started talking about masonry and I actually found my great uncle's, one of his um, degree books just on a shelf randomly falling apart and I saw his name in it and I asked my my uncle and my old man about it and then they started telling me about masonry and that got me into it and I ended up the ring that I wear is actually his from oh nice the 1950s or so when he became a master mason and they passed it on to me after I started talking about it with them could you give us a close-up of that ring yeah I think so there we go I don't know if it's oh, focusing or not. Too. That's cool. Yeah. We don't see a lot of those. But, but yeah, so I have the, you know, the, the lineage of the the ring. I have the documentation and everything. I've been trying to keep track in that way. You know, eventually we'll all be those old men sitting around Lodge and I'll pass it on to somebody else, I'm sure. But. Fantastic. So you, you mentioned, uh, you know, finding out about the, the mayor's mansion and stuff. Is that what launched you into your path in Freemasonry? Just that, that curiosity or what was it that made you want to make that leap and say, you know, this, this is really for me? Well, I think, you know, as we get into why we have that statue uh, looking over my shoulder in a little while, there's a lot of ties and sort of how I present with Ahab and the, you know, the, the mission that we have. And there's, there's a lot of similarities upon like improving yourself and, and such that I think just tied us into masonry and made me more curious about, you know, getting to know uh, the brothers in my area and just the fact that we travel so much. It's, I get a chance to see if, you know, the lodges are open. It's an awesome chance for me to visit other lodges and, you know, meet other people. And if they're not, it's still just architecture that I, hunt down when I'm when I'm traveling and at least try to you know for sure. see the outside of these buildings well that's awesome so yeah you, you did point out we got another set of eyes back there kind of staring <laughs> me down because I haven't allowed him to introduce himself um, so uh, why don't you tell us who is this uh, mystery man in the yellow coat yeah so Captain Ahab behind me was actually uh, came into my family because of a World War II prank so a lot of people in the service back then, and I, I still think it goes on now, but I can't confirm it. But in World War II, uh, my grandfather, not on the masonry side, was in the Navy. And it was just, you know, they would all go out, have a drink or too many before leaving that port town to, you know, for their first day of service. And, you know, the, the officers in the pub would see all the tension sort of in the room. And so they would tell them about this prank that they would pull where you would commandeer something from the port town, take it on the ship and make it a stowaway. So you, and then you would write a scrapbook, you know, make a scrapbook with, you know, writing letters, plastering it with cargo stickers and stamps and, you know, maybe a few pictures. But the idea was to bring it back, you know, whenever your tour was over a year, 18 months, two years later, and you would leave the book on the steps with the, the gnome or whatever, you know, artifact you borrowed. Right. And knock on the door, hide in the bushes, and the once very sad parents would be very happy to see that not only did their possession return, but they had this really cool coffee table like scrapbook of it's not just a lawn ornament, it's you know this traveling mascot in a way. Um, but as you see, Ahab is with me now, which means they never returned them. They got a little <laughs> uh, too inebriated that night, and two years goes by, and you can't really recognize the lawns. So. But instead of letting that deter them, they kept them. And every year they got back together at a farmhouse. They all went together at, on him and his naval uh, comrades. And so for 59 years, we had this reunion between the five families. And I grew up thinking that, you know, we were all related by blood, basically. They were so close. And, you know, like I said, 59 years, they would get back together and all take a week and bring him somewhere else. Basically. 59 years. Yeah. 
So the statue kept the camaraderie with them that I'd never seen. I just assumed everybody had friends that were, you know, half a century in, in the making. But as I get older, come to find out, like, it's harder and harder to find those excuses to get together. But the statue kept them together. And by sheer luck, it was passed on to me for my 19th birthday. And we're on year 17 right now. So we just keep traveling and, and spreading sort of the story. And that's, you know, a much more abbreviated version of a much larger story, which I'm oh, sure we'll sure. get into bits and pieces of. And yeah, if so, I remember correctly, you and uh, Captain Ahab have the same birthday, isn't that right? Yeah, so that was part of oh, the man. rite of passage, basically. So they all were in the service around 19. Um, and when I turned my 19th year, they passed them on to me. So, and that's what started me down this road. I haven't met anybody with the same birthday us basically yet to pass them on to but i think we'll have to that won't be uh, a necessary detail in the future with the, the next generation that's the caretaker of his chronicles but we'll see you never know that's fantastic man yeah I'd, so so the first time i got a chance to meet you was back at masonicon and you were actually telling the story and mm -hmm. it was just one of those stories you just it's like you can't make this up type stuff but it, it's, <laughs> it's an amazing story and I don't know, I just, the thing I really loved about it is, you know, it started out of this prank and everyone's got their pranks through all the generations, but that's the first prank that I've ever heard that for one was so well thought out and two was so meaningful. You know, it's, it's not a harmful prank. You know, you spray, spray paint in a windshield or, you know, slashing a tire like that. Right. You know, someone think, oh, you know, they're, they're pissed off at first because something got stolen, but you know, after a while it's like, wow, you know, and then the memories, the connection, that's just so genuine, man. You, I guess one question I have for you right off the bat, um, for you know, people that don't know the story well enough, first of all, I, I urge you to go online and check out the story. I mean, you've, you're on TED Talk, right? Yep, we did a, a TEDx event in Akron, Ohio in 2017, a couple of years back. Right. Um, and uh, 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 could you tell us some of the more unique places you and Captain Ahab have been or some of the more unique things that you and Captain Ahab have done? Sure. I mean, there's a lot, so I, it's hard to pick like a favorite, but, but yeah, after I acquired him, my grandfather and his naval comrades, they're my uncles, great uncles. Um, they weren't really photographers. You know, they had big fish type of stories that they would tell and retell and retell, but uh, <laughs> they, they weren't really uh, taking any visual, uh, anything with this guy so when i got him i i made it a point to have a camera hanging around his neck back when disposable cameras were the the thing and so we've been documenting this so and that's what robert's talking about all so we've been adventuring we try to get out as much as we can essentially and show people that if the statue would that is you know, 43 pounds if i can take him with me on all these adventures then you should be doing all the things that you find excuses not to do essentially in your day to day. For but sure. uh, yeah, he's been whitewater rafting, skydiving. Um, we trek through through Chile, like all down through the, the southern half of Patagonia. That was that was a blast. Reminiscing about afterwards. Um, yeah, we've been to some you know staples of our country like Rushmore. I, I try to. We haven't done all the national parks yet, but we've done forty two states worth of at least half the national parks we have, I feel like. Um, I have to cheat and look around. And so in my office here, I have all like the favorites, you know, all hanging up. That's awesome. But, uh, yeah. But yeah, we've been part, we participate in the Red Bull Flute Dog, which is a flying competition that Red Bull held, holds in different cities every couple of years. Uh, we built a pirate ship for that one. So we crashed and burned pretty hard in terms of flight uh, distance, but <laughs> everybody really enjoyed it. And does uh, Captain Ahab go to lodge with you when you attend the lodge? So he was at all my degrees. <laughs> um, and I don't know if he's got, I don't believe he has official documentation yet, but he has uh, accepted pretty much any lodge that I go to in Massachusetts. Nobody's given him a hard time. Uh, I really hope you can get him appointed as an officer at some point. <laughs> yeah, I, I figure there's, there, you know, 
there's decades to come with masonry and I haven't really pushed it. But um, when I first started spreading my wings in masonry, like we have very small lodges around Western Mass and through the many Facebook groups that are through Massachusetts, I just put the video you guys mentioned out there and I just said, I would love to help out any way I can. And um, people like Brian, uh, Michael Jarzabek, like that, that whole, you, you know, the core of Massachusetts, basically it's, it's the same names that come about, but right. they, they got a hold of me and I started doing um, presentations for LOI talking about just like how each lodge is unique and each lodge also has things, you know, we have relics that don't always need to be behind display cases. They could be, you know, like a traveling gavel type of thing and just right. trying to find that unique thing about each lodge and have them start building or sharing a story about it. So I got to present in just about every district um, in Massachusetts for, you know, the, the LOI sections of the, the monthly stuff and I got to meet you know, hundreds if not thousands of masons just in my own state. Gee, that's a that's a really fantastic point to bring up because some guys are going to watch this and go okay cool but what's this have to do with Masonic history and the neat thing is with with your being in masonry Ahab has kind of gotten his own Masonic history along the way mm -hmm. during these visits and I kind of remember you telling me uh, he had a unofficial degree at some point is that correct? <laughs> Yeah, sir. I like. I mean, I, like, like I said, he's uh, he gets dressed up with me. He's got a, a tuxedo, and I bring him to lodge. And and sometimes, you know, I you know we'll go visit lodges, and they love to put him in the chairs and take pictures or do a you know a mock up of of something. But hold on, I, I gotta stop you right there. He has a tuxedo. Yes. All right. I, I totally feel a meme getting created right after this episode because <laughs> I've always heard you know. Well, I dress up for lodge. Now it's gonna. Even Ahab dresses up for Lodge, guys. <laughs> right. Well, but, you know, we got I've actually button. seen a photo of, of the tuxedo uh, when uh, Captain Ahab was causing mischief at a wedding. Yeah, so he gets it's the weddings that we get invited to, and we thought it would be fun. We had a, a friend that was very talented in, in terms of customizing and tailoring a, a tux <laughs> for him. But, but, yeah, he always gets into trouble at weddings, basically. Well, he dresses up, uh, you know, he cleans up nice. Jeej, uh, I think your story is amazing. Uh, I, I've watched your TED Talk I don't know how many times. I've been making people watch your TED Talk. <laughs> I, I feel like that's the kind of thing that uh, TED Talks have been around long enough that when people hear, hey, I've got this TED Talk I want you to watch, most people start rolling their eyes. Every single person I've made watched it was thrilled and have been telling the story. Uh, so I'd like to share a story with you that I think is part of what made your story resonate so much with me. Uh, my great grandfather was a Mason. He's, he's primarily the person that I followed into the craft. Uh, his name's uh, Bernard Raftery. And uh, his name was Bernard Raftery, I should say. Uh, but uh, he uh, was in Hawaii at the time Pearl Harbor uh, occurred uh, with the Army. Uh, he was part of the 92nd. Uh, AFA, which I think is Armored Field Artillery. Uh, so he was in charge uh, as a colonel of some howitzer cannons uh, throughout Korea. Uh, he had also served in World War II prior to that. But it's his time in Korea that I think is especially relevant here. Uh, and that's because his battalion uh, really established a name for themselves, not only among their comrades, but also among the enemies who, uh, I, I think it was the enemies who nicknamed his group the Red Devils. Uh, and uh, so they had red devils painted on their uh, cannons, uh, red devil patches on their uniforms. And in 1953, one of my great grandfather's soldiers carved in this wooden mask. Oh, wow. Uh, and uh, so this is uh, an original uh, 92nd uh, armored field artillery red devil mask. Uh, made in 1953. Uh, at the time, uh, the 92nd was uh, taking place in what I think is referred to as the Battle of Inchon. And I, I should know these details better, but uh, it's considered one of the worst uh, incidents, uh, one of the uh, uh, more deadly incidents of warfare during the Korean War. Uh, 
uh, mm -hmm. when uh, he and uh, his comrades were selected to stay behind while the Marines were evacuating, which I think says a lot about uh, what he must have seen during that time. And one of the men that served with him uh, during that battle made him this mask. And I always like to say, because I think it's unusual bragging rights, uh, that my great grandfather was uh, a colonel and fought in the only battle in human history in which the first projectile launched was a roll of toilet paper. Uh, and uh, <laughs> that's because uh, one of uh, my papa's men was at the latrines taking care of business. Uh, nothing was happening until while in media race, if you will, uh, a Chinese soldier crawled, crawled up uh, and, through the mud and uh, was spotted by this guy while he was doing his business. And so all he had available was the toilet paper he was holding <laughs> in his hand. He threw it at the guy and ran back to uh, the American soldier screaming, uh, the Chinese are here, the Chinese are here. And so the battle began. Uh, but uh, I guess uh, the reason I wanted to share it is because it's wildly uh, similar uh, mm -hmm. to uh, your story with Captain Ahab. I have foolishly not taken this mask on my travels with me. Uh, but over the years, I have gone uh, to Europe and elsewhere around the country and taken photos of myself uh, in the exact same spots when I could as photos I have of my great grandfather 50, 60, 70 years ago because he was an amateur photographer. So mm -hmm. uh, I really admire you uh, and respect what you're doing. And uh, I can't imagine how many people you're inspiring with it. Yeah, I mean, we're, you know, we hope even every once in a while. It's just, it's sort of like if you're an educator or a teacher type of thing like every once in a while you really connect with you know one out of a thousand or who knows what the number is but we hope if we just keep doing it we end up with a, a couple dozen that we end up affecting if not hopefully more for sure well i you know i can throw in a for one thing, you know, people that listen to the story and, you know, hear about you taking them all around the world on these travels. Uh, it's not just talk. It's not, you know, it's not for the fact of the story. I've seen them do it firsthand when, uh, when we were up there for the Masonic Con in Boston, um, on that last day there, Brian actually took us all around uh, the story. Everyone's heard about me getting lost at Prince Hall's. Bay. Oh yeah. I remember you getting lost uh, <laughs> on that track. Uh, Jeej was with us and he was lugging this dude around with him the whole way. Um, actually, I, I couldn't find all the pictures, sadly, but I do got a couple here. If I can, I haven't shared my screen yet. Let's see if we can do this. You guys able to see that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so there is the uh, Chamber of Reflection at the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts with uh, Captain Ahab in the, in the chamber. And then we've got another one down here. This isn't a good, it's a nice blurry one, but there you see him... Uh, lugging Ahab around the Grand Lodge as we were, uh, you know, checking out all the different rooms. So, you know, I, I can say firsthand, I watched you uh, carry Ahab all around uh, Boston that day. And, you know, several of the guys, I remember saying, hey, you know, let me let me take that burden off your shoulders. And you're like, no, I got this. <laughs> How heavy is he? Uh, he's 43 pounds, give or take. That's not, that's not something to laugh at when it comes to no. carrying him around everywhere. No, and I've definitely met other traveling companions of other families or, or groups but you know usually people have like a teddy bear or a little rubber ducky or something and you know I always like when we were going through Patagonia I was not saying nice things about my grandfather half the time wishing they commandeered something much lighter but <laughs> reflecting back you don't remember you know, the, the raw shoulders and the you know all that kind of stuff Just for sure well you know I, I was going to bring it up earlier you know one question I have for you is there, there's no way you could ever known, you know, the, the, or that your grandfather would ever known where it would have gone from the day that they picked it up out of that lawn. But for you, this kind of becoming such a, you know, a huge part of your life. I mean, you see all the amazing things that you've done. How big of an impact do you think this has had on your life in the grand scale? Do you, do you think you would have managed half of these trips, these experiences, uh, if, if you didn't have the Ahab uh, motives behind it? Uh, not at all. I don't know how much I've, I've always, like I grew up uh, traveling a lot type of things, visiting between uh, my parents and, and things like that. So I always was in long car rides, road trips type of thing. But, and I think, you know, I would naturally do it a little bit, but 
like the world's largest ball of twine in, in Kansas out yeah. there. Like me and my friends would have never jumped in the car and went there, but we used Ahab as an excuse to do it. So it just, you know, became part of a road trip. And I think it's, everybody should have an excuse like that. You know, like we, we can all plan on doing something. I think masonry is a great excuse to get a bunch of people together yeah. and do things you normally wouldn't do. It's just another tie in like that. But there's, so many things that I've done with him. And it's just because I'm like, I have to bring him to do this to show other people that they should be doing these things. And it's definitely, it's, it's definitely uh, skewed my normal uh, train of thought, I think, to, to just plan the trips around him. For sure. You know, when I was uh, learning your story, and even here thinking about it, there's a parallel, and, and, and Alex mentioned earlier, well, what does this have to do with Masonic history? I actually think this is one of the most relevant stories I have heard in a long time to uh, something that's happening right now in Masonic history. And uh, it, walk with me here. Uh, so as I understand it, for many, many years, uh, decades, your grandfather and his buddies had Ahab as a comrade uh, in generally private uh, get-togethers, poker games, things like mm -hmm. that. Uh, they kind of kept him to himself uh, or to themselves uh, in the same way that, say, uh, the Masons of 40, 50, 60, 70 years ago were kind of keeping it to themselves. Uh, and uh, eventually Ahab was passed on to you in the same way that masonry is currently undergoing a transition and being passed on to a new generation. And you, you, you have changed it. Uh, you've changed some of the dynamic because Ahab's not sitting alone with a few men in a poker room anymore. He's traveling all over the world and inspiring other people to establish uh, those kind of important connections. And that's not to say that the time Ahab spent in those poker rooms was for naught or wasn't meaningful. Obviously it was, otherwise they wouldn't have done it for so long. Uh, uh, but it is to say that what you're doing extends the legacy of what those guys were doing at that time. And I think that's the exact same thing that's happening right now as masonry transitions from one generation to the next. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. It's funny, and I know I didn't get into many of the details of our story and most people watching this will have to find the talk and get some details and then maybe revisit, sure. you know, the podcast, but that's exactly what it was. I mean, they got together every year, they played a card game to, and the winner would pick the next destination. And like I mentioned the ball of twine, like that was one of my, my uncle's like bucket list things. And I'm pretty sure they all decided outside of that card game that they would cheat to make sure he never won. So they have, they would have to go to that ball of twine, which is why it was one of the first things that we did. But what it is, it was just one of those things. They kept it private. I don't, I don't know for a fact about this, but I think it was just their way of sort of solving their, you know, PTSD from way back when the shell shock, all that kind of stuff. Sure. Because my grandfather was a very, you know, he mostly kept to himself. He was, you know, angry, but quiet. I'll, I'll call him. Um, but when he got together for that week, when we all got together, they were just all, you know, little kids. They were just talking, you know, all the stories I'd never hear throughout the rest of the year. They would all come up again for this week. And it was just this, the camaraderie they had that they used Ahab as an excuse to you know, get back together and keep this annual reunion happening. It just, it definitely changed them. And I can see how the older generations of masonry or decades ago, even if it was just, you know, everybody getting together, talking them small talk about whatever it was, I could see how having a group, a large group of people get together like that and just hanging out was positive, even if you were talking about the weather or, you know, it, it wasn't about secrets or anything like that. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, sort of passing knowledge around and, and passing on. And now, like I'd noticed right after I got them, I was in, I was at university. So I just thought everybody was outgoing at college. And that's why they all sort of wanted to hear the story and take a picture with them and all that kind of stuff. But after leaving college, I realized that he made everybody sort of question why, you know, it would, it's obviously a, a different thing than you see every day, but it just having that ice breaking ability. 
and I think now, just like you said with masonry, it's sort of the doors are they're not they're not wide open, but they're not sort of locked as much as they were anymore in terms of us trying to I don't know share information and you know just educate people on the the sort of benefits of uh, this brotherhood. Yeah, oh, yeah. I think it's fantastic. a beautiful thing. Uh, question. Ahab's clothes are just immaculate, very bright, uh, <laughs> except for the black, which is very dark. I'm, I'm curious, uh, I'm assuming, especially with all the traveling, you have to do some touch-up work. Yeah, so the coat I haven't painted in a number of years, oh. but I will give, a, will give it a touch-up. I've been leaning away from it because the better cameras get, the more like he's just straight bright yellow. So it, it can really mess up some contrast um, in the pictures. So I've been trying to leave him a little rougher on the edges. He's getting to the point where uh, his face is showing its age. Cause I look at pictures from 15 years ago and he's got a bright white beard and you know, pale <laughs> complexion. And now it's like this, this grayish dirtyish beard and things. And I, like I said, looking at pictures before, you know, I think he looks the same because I see him every day, but right. I'm starting to hey. notice there's a little wear and tear. Um, he's earned it, man. I mean, he, he yeah. came from World War II. <laughs> yeah. but, he's been through some stuff. Yeah, but when I got him, um, the base was just the the wood and it was sort of dry rotting a little bit. I, you know, mm. he started off on a lawn. My grandfather and then his, his buddies, they, you know, kept him in a barn most of the time or it was in the back of his truck during the rest of the year type of thing. So it just was in the elements. So we, I basically fiberglassed like a, out of the same material you would re, redo a car bumper or things like that. I fiberglassed the bottom of them to sort of seal it up. And then he's covered in Gorilla Tape just because, um, just so he doesn't scratch things. Cause we do go to museums or a car show or you know just anything and just as sort of like a buffer but yeah, there's constant maintenance on him basically all the time. That's awesome, man. So what are, what are some of the travels that you got planned coming up for you guys? Um, let's see. We were just you actually a crazy uh, map behind you. I love that. By the way. Yeah. So <laughs> the map is, you know, everywhere in our, our country we've been, and then there's, Ireland, Sweden's down in the corner. There's a small one of Chile. They're obviously not uh, proportional, but we try to we try to keep maps of every destination. Um, we were just back in Boston uh, over the weekend. Um, we did Boston Common because that was the one piece of that that trek around Boston we didn't we didn't do when we were all there for Masonic Con. I feel like we did all the outskirts, but I personally didn't go in the Common anyways. But we were just there. Um, we got one of our uh, crewmates, or one of our core is getting married uh, this weekend. So we're doing that down in Pennsylvania. Nice. But we have, I'm looking at the, the schedule now, we got a few talks lined up. Uh, we're going to Austin in March. We're doing. Wait, 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 wait. What? <laughs> we're doing Where? Austin ish area. Jeez. Yeah, I, I live part time in Austin. <laughs> well, there we go. When is I was, this? I was gonna um around March twentieth. I want to say the All last right. third. Yeah. Well, I figured when you said you were gonna be in Cooperstown too, I figured that's it's not super close, but it's much closer than Texas. So I figured we were gonna our paths are gonna cross at some point. I have a feeling. Uh, oh man, you. Uh, oh yeah oh yeah this is gonna be great so there's there's so many places I, I i i would love to take you in austin the museum of the weird uh longhorn cavern uh oh man that's cool what, are you, what yeah. are you planning to do in austin so the same uh crew member that's getting married usually once a year we one year we did like a bourbon tour in kentucky and tennessee and we went but to a bunch of underground like lakes and and rivers like mammoth cave that kind of stuff too um, another year we did, uh, Costa Rica. And then this year we're, we were just going to go down to Texas, do barbecue, bourbon, whatever else we could find type of thing. It's, 
it's uh i think we're doing four or five days i can't remember but very nice cool. but yeah we can we can definitely try to meet up or you know have a, a an adventure that we all get together on for sure yeah yeah i'm i'm, I'm excited i can't wait to have you down here yeah and then let's see there's a few other things, but uh, in May, we're going to do something moderately stupid and uh, try to uh, get to the Everest Base Camp in Nepal. Oh, man. Yeah. Wow. So we, we spoke out in Colorado a few years back at, a, at an orientation for a college, and one of the students that happened to be there, you know, we, we give a presentation, we talk about, you know, the importance of icebreakers. You know, whether it's, you know, like a hat or you color your hair different or a funny t-shirt or lawn ornament. Um, <laughs> talking about how, you know, most of your friends are, you know, every friend you have come from strangers at one point. So at that point, uh, talking about it at the orientation, like, you know, they had best friends in the room they didn't know yet and things like that. But at the end, we make a bucket list with all the students. And then I check back in with the university, you know, a, upon them getting close to graduation because you can't really teach anybody how quick time goes by or how all of your excuses get in the way and you don't realize how much time goes by until they get their bucket list back years later and they realize they might not have gotten to those things they thought they would do in the four year spans of college. Um, but anyways, one of the, the kids was really gung ho about his bucket list. He put, he wanted to join the Peace Corps, you know, see a bunch of places in the world. Nepal was one of them. Climb up to at least the base camp of Everest, all these things. And years later, he got a hold of me. He's in Nepal, in the Peace Corps, and he wants to go to the base camp. And I tell all the kids, if you need help with anything or want us to come with you, ask and we'll do it. And I'm putting my, my foot in my mouth now because we're going to have to attempt this. But uh, so yeah, training starts basically February 9th after we have one event on the 8th that we got to get through and then there's three months of very intense training for that i can imagine man wow yeah. well we are rooting for you dude that's that's for sure I, i'm a little jealous here you're going down to texas what when, when is your trip to kansas bro <laughs> well we'll have to figure that stuff out <laughs> he already did that to see the ball of twine i yeah. know which i feel like a horrible kansan because i've never even gone to see the stupid ball of twine and now i have to yeah so, that's like a Texan not going to see the Alamo. <laughs> that that's a really horrible comparison, but yeah, <laughs> well, whatever. <laughs> yeah. You get the Alamo, I get a ball of twine. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I I know a little bit of history about the tw ball of twine. I should say I know more than most, but it's not that much at all. But I know there was a equal uh, size war, we'll say, between two farmers that were trying to compete for the world's largest ball of twine. Okay. Yeah, I, I read a little bit about it a long time ago, but yeah, I, yeah, I, I don't only know. Found that, doesn't, out. that doesn't sound quintessentially Kansan at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, touche. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Well, dude, we really, really appreciate having you on the show today. I mean, this this story is just one that cannot really be duplicated. It's it's so unique but so powerful at the same time. Um, yeah, I, I guess before I, before I uh, rant on with mine, I want to send this around for kind of final uh, remarks. And within that, we definitely want you to throw in uh, kind of some shameless plugs, how, how to get a hold of you, how they can see your stuff, all that good stuff. And obviously where we can get those shirts. I know Robert was talking about it in the green room, but they are awesome. We all want one. So uh, we'll hand it to you first, Jeej, for final thoughts and uh, some shameless plugs as well. Sure. Let's see. Um... Well, the website is ahabsadventures.com. The swag is on there. The, the talk is on there. But if you want to search for the talk separately, it's a pirate's guide to commandeering life. Um, but yeah, you can find that on the, the TED channel. And yeah, the, the website has over 9,000 pictures of Ahab all over the place at this point. Wow. Um, a few videos things like that. Like I said, the skydiving, the rafting, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, but yeah, and, and most of the time if we're traveling, it's either revolving around a, a presentation at a college or business or really we, you know, we love sharing the story. So we'll, we'll do it in a coffee house or, you know, whenever somebody asks that we're, we're live. 
but and we try to revolve all our travel around you know speaking somewhere and making a road trip out of it or you know we we plan these these trips not just around speaking but just ahab has a bucket list on the site um that's i think it's there's 200 something items on there and we've done 200 or so already but it's just ongoing usually i take all the bucket lists and compile them from other people and that becomes sort of his bucket list so if anybody has any ideas feel free to reach out we're always open to trying anything really fantastic well brother robert what's uh, what's your final thoughts uh i've got a few of them if you don't mind me holding you hostage for a bit you guys good yeah. No, 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 yeah. First, first of all, I, I want to say my wheels are just turning in hyperspeed about things to do in Austin. You're probably <laughs> going to get tired of me, but uh, it uh, sounds like I'm going to have to plan a whole second trip already. Well, and and uh, if it helps, I can I can give you a place to stay that doesn't charge hotel fees. It's 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 <laughs> just a, a good fellowship is all I require. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there's a place called the Museum of the Weird. Johnny Depp lived there in the '90s. Uh, there are pirates to take pictures with. There's uh, some kind of freak show performers, really strange artifacts. And I just really feel like uh, Captain Ahab uh, would get some good photos there, but also kind of fit in in his yeah. own special way. Um, and of course, as I say, keep Austin weird. So can't go yeah. there without it. Uh, the other things I'd like to hit on is uh, it's Grand Lodge of Texas week. Uh, we're having our uh, uh, stated communication this year. Yeah, that's coming uh, up, ain't on, it? This, what's that? That's coming right up, isn't it? Yeah, actually, it starts tomorrow. Uh, and uh, we've been getting uh, ready. Uh, the Grand Lodge of Texas has been in Waco for over 100 years. We're kind of the host lodge and always have been. Uh, and we take it seriously. So we smoked 800 pounds of brisket. Uh, we've got uh, 80 pounds of coffee in waiting. Uh, it's Busy Brew Masonic Coffee, which is a lodge project. And... Um, I suspect uh, that some of those guys will be listening to at least historical light shows on their way into town. It might not be this episode, but they'll probably be listening to some of our talks. Um, let's see, we've got a concert on Friday night, uh, the Waco Masonic concert. And uh, it's kind of neat because uh, uh, all the guys are in town, which we got 70,000 Masons in Texas, about three to 4,000 come to vote at Grand Lodge. And, uh, a few years ago, uh, we started uh, the Waco Masonic Concert Series, and really it's just about guys getting together to have a good time uh, instead of just doing business while they're in town. And it has grown from 17 people the first year to 300 last year, and we're thinking it's probably going to nice. double and be around five or 600 this year. Uh, and uh, so it's becoming a special event. Um, last week, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, point out that uh, what we refer to, uh, we use the title Right Worshipful, uh, Right Worshipful Orville O'Neill of the Grand Lodge of Texas, who is a living legend in this state. He's a past grand everything. Uh, he uh, <laughs> retired from his role as uh, Grand Secretary, uh, in which he has just worked his tail off for the last few years. Uh, I don't know if Orville listens to this show, but if you do, Orville, uh, I, I got to tell you from the bottom of my heart, uh, thank you for all your years of service uh, and uh, advice you've given to me over that time because it's really made a difference in my Masonic career. I've got a couple of things of swag I'd like to uh, show off if I can. Uh, one comes from uh, Yeti's Gorgeous Grains. He's a brother who does wood turning and stuff like that. Uh, and it's a custom pin he sent me. Uh, he said every secretary needs a pin. Uh, the lid, I know it's kind of hard to see, it's kind of shiny. Uh, the lid is made out of copper. Uh, there's a piece of silver. And more importantly, acacia uh, is the handle. Uh, so kind of a, a, a neat piece. And the other item I'd like to show, this is the first ever reveal. This thing has been in waiting for, uh, oh gosh, eight months. Uh, it's going to be presented this Friday. Uh, and... Uh, you guys are going to be the first ones to really see it. This is uh, an apron made by Patrick Craddock. Wow. Uh, this is the past master apron. Our lodge has the tradition of presenting a past master apron to outgoing uh, masters uh, in their uh, following year, if the brethren thought they earned it. And uh, in this case, 
the brethren did think that Brother Dave McCam earned his ape room. This is a depiction of the past master jewel that Paul Revere made in the 1700s. Yeah. Uh, and of course, the 47th problem of Euclid, which Brother McCam chose as his logo during his year. It's got his name and information engraved. And something I think every Masonic apron should have a secret pocket yeah. uh, for yeah. gloves or whatever other items someone might want to put in there. Uh, so uh, cool stuff coming through here and an exciting week. Um, Saturday night, relevant to historical light, we're having the first annual night at the museum uh, to cap off the Grand Lodge of Texas week. Uh, We've been uh, working a partnership with the Waco History Museum, which is near our Grand Lodge, and it houses things like a vest that belonged to George Washington, the bed President Zachary Taylor died in, uh, a rising sun chair, uh, original and same model as the one George Washington sat in during the Constitutional Convention, uh, a lot of really, really neat local, regional, and national artifacts. Uh, and we're going to have free run of it, uh, Masons and Masons friends. So uh, I know now short notice, but maybe sometime in the future, you guys can join us at a night at the museum. Uh, I want to say uh, thank you uh, again, uh, Captain Ahab and your sidekick, uh, Brother Jeej uh, Wiles. I think it's really cool that uh, Captain Ahab has uh, been through a degree. And uh, <laughs> I bet he was more lively than uh, some other brothers I've seen during degrees. And uh, uh, thanks for the inspiration. It's a really, really cool story. Yeah, no thanks needed. I honestly, I, I could tell it a thousand times a day. I think it's just, you know, everybody motivates me just as much as they get motivated from the story. I feel like so it keeps me going too. It's a, it's a self-serving sometimes. We'll say. For sure. Well, I guess I'll kick off my final thoughts, um, man. Brother Robert, you, you mentioned uh, Grand Lodge of Texas uh, having their annual session this weekend. Totally planned to be there. Uh, we've been planning it for so long. Uh, my wife just uh, started a brand new position. I'm recent in my position and just we've had a lot of sick days with the kids and stuff. So unfortunately, not able to squeeze it in. Super bummed about it. Um, it's going on the calendar. I will be there next year. We're going to make it happen. Uh, so just everyone down in Texas know that uh, I am thinking about you guys. I hope you have a very uh, happy and successful Grand Lodge session down there. Uh, totally wanted to check out you guys' concert and the barbecue looked amazing. I've been checking that out on the uh, Facebook there, drooling over my phone. So I know it's going to be an awesome event. Um, and congratulations, to Brother Dave, on that uh, awesome apron. Uh, to be able to wear something from Patrick Craddock is a, a pleasure and honor in its own. So that's uh, fantastic. But uh, to the to the meat of the show, Brother Jeej, thank you so much, sincerely, uh, for coming on the show. Uh, we, we've kind of talked about this for, for a while now. Uh, just uh, haven't been able to pull to the punch to make it happen. But uh, yeah, ever since I you know met you up there in Boston at the uh, Masonic Con there, I uh, just fell in love with the story, uh, fell in love with the passion that you have for this and uh, the way that you've carried it through. Um, I mean... It would be so cool. If I, if I could wish one thing, it would be that your grandfather could have seen into the future. And when uh, they picked that out of that lawn to be able to just envision what it would uh, in, entail uh, for the years moving forward, I think he would be uh, just thoroughly blown away, uh, impressed and honored um, by what you've taken from the story and uh, turned it into and uh, kept that tradition alive. You know, that's something that we're huge about here on Historical Light is, uh, you know, keeping that history alive. And uh, you are doing that better than uh, most people I know. So hats off to you, man. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, we'll definitely uh, want to encourage everybody to go check out the video, the TED Talk and everything. Get the complete story. You're, you're going to want to see it. Uh, it's, it's like Robert said, you're going you're gonna to be telling everybody about it and making everybody watch the video. It's, it's just one of the stories that uh, there is, there's no parallel to it. It's, it's awesome. Uh, so definitely go check that out. Thanks again. We'll get all your links into the, uh, the comments below and, uh, go buy one of those t-shirts. Be, uh, be part of the team of, uh, Captain Ahab. All right. Uh, until then we'll uh, invite everybody to join us over in the uh, Facebook group. That is the historical light Masonic research group on Facebook. If you're not a member, make sure you go join and uh, get in on the unique conversation that's going on there. Uh, again, we keep that tailored to Masonic history. It's not like all the other groups out there that get flooded with a bunch of randomness. Uh, we keep it tailored in. So if you're into Masonic history, uh, that group is for you. 
So go join the conversation there and we will see you there until next time. Until then, keep seeking light. Take care, brothers. Cheers.